you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to have you guys as well here. As always, the Chris Voss Show is the family that loves you but doesn't judge you, at least not as harshly as your mother-in-law. She never liked you anyway, and uh, the other, the previous boyfriend was the one that she liked. So uh, work harder. But what would help with uh, getting her on your good side is refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives, especially her. To go to goodreads.com, for chess Chris Voss, youtube.com, for chess Chris Voss, linkedin.com, for chess Chris Voss, Chris Voss, one of the TikTokity, and uh, Chris Voss, facebook.com. We bring you the smartest people on the show none of them are me that's why we have guests on the show so we have some someone smart on here and as always the ceos the billionaires the white house presidential advisors the pulitzer prize winning journalists authors all the smartest minds the people that come to you and bring you their stories and if you don't learn something from these shows damn it well uh go listen to them all again so there you go anyway we have an amazing author on the show with us today he's the author of the newest book that comes out january 23rd 2024 it's called fluke chance chaos and why everything we do matters and uh, i think you're gonna learn some things here you might learn about how your life works i'm 56 and i'm still trying to figure it out damn it we have brian Kloss, the author on the show with us today he grew up in minnesota he earned his he earned his d phil uh I believe degree of philosophy is that what that means yeah it's, it's 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 the pretentious way that oxford calls a phd see i flunked <laughs> i flunked high second grade so i don't know these things but this must be like an oxford sort of lingo or something it is so indeed he's all the way from oxford folks that's how smart he is there's a lot of smart people that come from oxford we have on the show he is now a professor of global politics at the university college of london he's a contributing writer for the atlantic host of the award-winning power corrupts podcast and frequent guest on national television he is conducted field research across the globe and advised major politicians and organizations, including NATO and the European Union. You can find him on his website at brianpkloss.com and Twitter at Brian Kloss. Welcome to the show, Brian. How are you? I'm doing really well. How are you? I am awesome. It's wonderful to have you. Congratulations on the new book. Any other dot coms or websites or social media you want people to follow you on? Sure. Yeah. I, I write a newsletter called The Garden of Forking Paths, so they can look me up that way as well. The Garden of Forking Paths, is that correct? Yeah, the Garden of Forking Paths. It's a, it's a metaphor that I use in the book, and it's also a short story by my favorite short story author. So it's a... Uh, yeah. There yeah. You there you go. So give us a 30,000 overview of what's inside your new book. Yeah. So I'm basically taking the argument of, of bringing chaos theory to human events <laughs> and oh. to our own lives. Mm -hmm. And I'm basically arguing that the world is swayed and diverted a lot more by accidental, arbitrary, even seemingly random forces than we often imagine. And there's this sort of standard overview that people will say, you know, the sort of smart thinking people will say, oh, you have to separate the signal from the noise. I'm focusing on the noise. I think the noise matters a lot. And I think it actually does change our lives and our societies a lot more than we imagine. So I, I don't agree with that separation. And I think it's something that we would be foolhardy to ignore. So we need to delve into it. But I mean, so do you believe fully in chaos theory and as a part of life? Or is it is it a mixed bag? No, I mean, fully. So the way that most people have heard of chaos theory is this butterfly effect idea, right? Like mm -hmm. a butterfly fa flapping its wings and then it creates a hurricane. Mm -hmm. So what, what chaos theory is actually saying that the technical jargon is, is sensitivity to initial conditions. But what this really means is that if anything small changes, it can have profound effects over, over time. Mm -hmm. And it's the reason why we can't forecast the weather, right? Because mm -hmm. if the measurements or the model is even t a tiny bit wrong, I mean like one millionth of a degree wrong, mm -hmm. then the model will be wrong with what the weather is going to look like after 10 days. That's what, that's what chaos yeah. theory is for our own, uh, you know, we, we, which we recognize very easily. Now, the way that I think the world works is that this is constantly happening. Hmm. It's just that we're oblivious to it. And, you know, the easiest way I can describe this is whenever we think about time travel, right? And you have science fiction and so on. 
the, the warning that people will tell you is, you know, if you go back in time, don't talk to anybody, don't squish any bugs, because you might totally change the future, right? You might delete yourself from the future. Mm -hmm. But the problem is we don't think about that in the present. Like we don't imagine that like we're constantly reshaping the future with everything we do. But of course, cause and effect operates exactly the same way in the past as it does in the future. So mm -hmm. chaos theory is something we accept when we think about time travel. It's not something we accept when we think about the present. And I think the present is where we're wrong. I think that I think that's happening constantly. We're constantly changing the trajectories of our future. We're just completely blind to it because we can't see alternative pathways that we might have taken. There you go. So this is a, so throughout the book, you're going to sell this concept to us and see how we how and, and the examples that support it. Give us a little bit of history about yourself. How did you grow up, and what led you down some of the paths and and to write and study some of the things you've done. Yeah, so I, I grew up in Minnesota, born and raised Minnesota, and very statriotic, I like to say. You know, I I, I loved my childhood and so on, and I started mm -hmm. studying politics, and I that's ultimately what led me to get a PhD in politics. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, you know, actually the origin story of this book comes from probably when I was about 25 years old, when my dad sat me down and told me this story. It was about a story about a tragedy, and it was in 1905 in a little farmhouse in in Wisconsin. And this, this woman who probably had postpartum depression, they didn't have a name for it in 1905, but that's probably what was going on. Mm -hmm. She snapped, she had a mental breakdown and she had four young children and she, she killed them. And then she took her own life. And I put this in the, in the introduction to Fluke because this is my great grandfather's first wife. Oh, wow. And he came home to the farmhouse and the whole family is dead. And he remarries mm -hmm. ultimately to my great grandmother, right? Mm -hmm. So I have this moment, I, I, I'm totally oblivious to this for my whole life until I'm in my mid-20s. My dad shows me this newspaper clipping, terrible act of insane woman, wow. what it says in the headline. And I realize that this is the only reason I exist, right? That but yeah. for this mass murder in Wisconsin 119 years ago, I don't exist. You're not listening to me if this doesn't happen, right? Huh, this is chaos yeah. theory in action. Yeah. But it's chaos theory for, for me personally, too, because everything in my life, every joy, every setback and so on is directly derived in part from you know, this tragedy of four children losing their lives 119 years ago. And I think, you know, this is the way the world actually works. Like she, of course, could never have anticipated that her actions would lead to me being on the Chris Voss show, but that is part of the story, right? Wow. That's kind so, of dark. She pulled that off just to get you on the show, man. There's <laughs> yes. easier ways to get on the show. Sorry. If that's it was a really, it, yeah. I mean, the publicist was very pleased, I'm sure, but it's uh, no, I mean, but it is, this is the way the world works. I think that we, we pretend otherwise we have like sort of neat categories for how we, imagine our lives unfolding with, you know, these building blocks of really big decisions. And actually, you know, we're, I, I had nothing to do with this, but it's, it's certainly central to the story of my existence. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, this is the stuff where my, this part of my upbringing then, you know, leads to an awareness of this and it starts to sort of affect my thinking because I start to feel a little bit like an accident of history mm -hmm. that makes you start to think mm -hmm. a little bit differently about the world and so on. And this is what the book derives from. There you go. Now, why, what, what are the oppositions that scientists or people that think about this stuff, what are the opposition, what does the opposition hold and why do they discount or, or oppose or argue against the chaos theory? Yeah, that's a great question. So the way I like to describe this is there's, there's two competing ideas in science, particularly mm -hmm. in the field of evolution between what's called contingency and convergence. Mm -hmm. And, Contingency is very easy to understand. The asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs is a contingent event because if that asteroid had been one second delayed, mm -hmm. then humans probably wouldn't exist, right? It wiped out mm -hmm. the dinosaurs in just the right way, and then mammals rise and humans emerge and so on. Mm -hmm. So anything is a little bit different there. The whole world is completely different. Wow. Convergence is this idea that like things just sort of work out and there's order in the world. So one of my favorite facts from science is that if you were to take an octopus's eye and you put it next to a human's eye, they're actually almost the same. And that's because like evolution just solved the problem of vision twice the same way because it just works. Like we can see, right? And so can the octopus. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea of this is, okay, yeah, chaos theory may divert things and so on, but you ultimately get to the same place in the end, the same way that the octopus and the human ended up with the same eye. So it's like this, these two competing concepts about order and disorder, right? Like the mm -hmm. asteroid is that like you change this one thing and the whole world ends up different. Mm -hmm. And that's more aligned with sort of chaos theory. And the convergence people are more like, yeah, okay. But like, ultimately there is some order because, mm -hmm. you know, if you make an eye made out of plastic, it's never going to work. You, you won't be able to see anything. So mm -hmm. like it's that, that, 
possibility is just ruled out. So, you know, there's debate about this and the degree to which these things actually matter. I, I think they matter a lot, but I think that there is some disagreement about the, you know, how much chaos theory can explain the trajectory of our existence. There you go. I, would a good example be like, say I'm driving down the road and I'm having mm-hmm. a bad morning because, I don't know, my coffee maker didn't work. So I'm kind of in a bad mood. Somebody cuts me off in traffic. I honk at them, flip them off. And I don't know, maybe I cut them off or, you know, whatever it is. So I, I pass down my shitty sort of little mood because my coffee maker won't work. Well, that person gets really angry. They go to, I don't know, wherever they go to. They, they end up picking a fight with somebody and somebody gets shot. Or maybe they go to a jail or something. Is that is that a is that like a simplistic sort of example of maybe flowing chaos theory? Yeah, no, I mean that that definitely is one. I mean the the mm-hmm. way I describe this, I, I talk about this idea in the book called the snooze button effect, and it's sort of like you know you imagine that you wake up and you feel tired, so you mm-hmm. hit the snooze button, and then your life rewinds five seconds and you don't hit the snooze button. And the question mm-hmm. is, what what differs, right? Does your life take on a different trajectory? Well, if you're delayed by five minutes, you know you will meet different people that day, and that will affect your trajectory huh. in some ways, right? Huh. Now, the thing the thing that I think is obvious about this, where people you know go from being sort of skeptical to being like, okay, yes, I, I accept this, is when you think about the moment of conception for a baby, right? So the second I'm not going to get too graphic here, but the second that a baby is conceived, <laughs> if you change a millisecond of that moment a yeah. different human gets born, right? Yeah. Now, if that makes sense, then it also makes sense that if you took a sip of coffee that day or didn't, mm-hmm. you've made a different human, right? Now, that is true for cause and effect throughout everything we do. I think this is the point that I'm trying to make is like, it, it's it, to get to the point, point where you conceive the baby at exactly that instant, everything mm-hmm. about your life had to be as it was. So mm-hmm. if you hit the snooze button once, you're going to have a different kid. And I think oh. the, th- the reason that we don't think about this is because it's bewildering. So mm-hmm. we just pretend like things get washed out. I don't think they get washed out. I think that we are constantly changing our lives and every word we use, every conversation we have slightly changes the trajectory we have through our existence. We're just completely blind to it because we can't see the alternative. So, you know, I, this is the kind of stuff where I think when I talk about the conception thing, people are like, oh yeah, that's obviously true because <laughs> it's going to be a slightly different, you know, a slightly different moment and a slightly different baby and, and a different person being born is going to change the world in some mm-hmm. way, sometimes big, sometimes small, but it's uh, it's not unimportant. And this is where I think it, it blows my mind to think this way, but mm-hmm. I also think it's just logically true. <laughs> so I, I would tend to agree with you. I, I you know, there, there are times where I've been like, hey, I'm going to go to the store. I'm going to go do something in the car. And I'll be like, mm, I don't want to go right now. I'll put it off five minutes or you put it off. And then you, 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 you drive, you take the drive and you miss a car accident by, by milliseconds or yeah. maybe you miss it by a few minutes and you're like, what if I had been here a few minutes ago and I left a few minutes earlier? Would I have been in the wrong place at the wrong time? In fact, that's a lot of, a lot of people say. So you, you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, maybe you weren't in the wrong place at the wrong time. You were just at that moment and there's not really a destiny to it. Do, do, does, does that sort of play into it? You know, I'm an atheist. There are people that believe that there's a, a god in the sky and he's got like a plan or something. And if you've seen things, I'm not sure what kind of plan that is or he's smoking crack. But jokes aside, you, you know, they, they believe that there's somebody, there's a hidden hand that's moving everything. And we all know it's the Illuminati, really, and uh, aliens. But, uh, and so when things happen, people try to attribute it to some sort of paternal, patriarchal sort of mastermind in the sky who's, you know, like, I, I'll give you an example. I remember, I remember the, the horror of of the Southern Baptist Church that was shot up by that racist young man years ago, and he stalked and killed those those parishioners, and he let one woman live so that she could glorify and tell his story in a sick way, and the woman came out and was telling everybody that God chose her as the one to live and you know, thank God, you know, he, he wanted, he had a plan for me, I think is what she said. And I'm like, it's pretty sick and twisted. Like God just said, fuck you to the other people. So it, do you, do you find that sometimes people mix, there's some sort of purpose in life, or maybe that's the delusion that we mix some sort of, well, somebody has a, somebody has a plan somewhere and we just have to live it sort of thing with yeah, so yeah. You've, you've hit the nail on the head, I think, with some of these ideas, because there's there's a, you know, there's this mantra, like, everything happens for a reason, which is stitched on pillows and stuff. Mm-hmm. But, like, a, you know, a, a lot of people believe this 
only when negative things happen. And there's a ton of psychology research that validates this, <laughs> right? So like when people win the lottery, they're like totally happy being like, yeah, it was just totally mm. random. I just got lucky. But when bad things happen, like the human mind is allergic to randomness. It's, it's impossible for us to cope with this. It's very, very difficult for many people to deal with it. Now, I think the thing that's interesting about this, and this is where, you know, I, 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 I'm also not a believer, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things I find really interesting is like when you look at the scientific evolution of human beings, one of my favorite studies, this came out like a year or two ago, was the scientists doing DNA analysis have evaluated that like the reason why humans or why mammals in general give live births, like why we don't lay eggs, mm -hmm. is because this creature that was a little bit like a shrew a hundred million years ago got infected by a mutated retrovirus and it created placenta. Right mm -hmm. now, the reason I'm telling you this is because this is if this did not happen, it's likely that mammals would not exist. Like all of human history is derived from this one true. Now, wow. the flip side of this is, OK, if you are a believer, this this is where I sort of, you know, I, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical. So I'm like, if you are a believer, would you say that God decided that the way to make a human was through the shrew being infected by the retrovirus. Now it's possible, right? There's a, there's an explanation there, but it is seemingly random to me. It's like pretty arbitrary. Mm -hmm. I thought yeah. it was the apple in the tree. Or, or <laughs> well, garden, well, this whatever. is what, this, this is where, I mean, you'd have to throw out all the science, right? I mean, this is the, <laughs> but, the, but yeah, I mean, but this is the question, right? I think there is, there is a, there is a great mystery. I'm not trying to be facetious because I, you yeah. know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not someone who judges people who have different viewpoints on this than me, but I, there, there is a great mystery. I mean, you know, scientists have, a sense of the Big Bang and so on, but there's you know there's evidence coming out that is challenging various parts of cosmology and so on. And I think we don't know. I think there's a lot of stuff we don't know. What I would say though is that regardless of whether there's some sort of grand cause to these things, mm -hmm. I think the effects of small changes are profound sometimes, and that mm -hmm. provides a, a challenge to our worldview because most of us have this sort of mythology of you know the American dream, for example. It's like you know oh if you just do these three things, then you'll be rich and you'll be happy. Mm -hmm. and it's no like that's not the way the world is. So I think there's this sort of like myth of modern Western modernity, which I, you know, is, is around this idea of, oh, you can control everything. You're the main character. <laughs> everything that you want to do is up to you. And mm -hmm. then like you actually peer at reality and you're like, there's a lot of stuff that you have absolutely no control over. And so the, yeah. the mantra I have in Fluke is I say, we control nothing, but we influence everything. And that's the sort of oh. idea of this, of, of the book in a way. There you go. That's why people can say, well, I'm going to manifest stuff. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I mean, I think it was George Carlin who said prayer works 50% of the time. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, I mean, there's an intentionality there that you, you focus on. If you want more money and you go, hey, God, can I get some more money? You, you probably tend to focus. The brain, the reticular activity system, the brain will focus on what you'd ask it to. So it'll be like, hey, let's figure out some, maybe some more money. And, and I think you kind of touched on my question I had let up, I had in the can for why do we fear it? And why do we, why do we have issues with it? You know, you mentioned that, you know, we, we, we kind of hope to feel like we have some sort of balance in our life. I mean, going through life, feeling like you're constantly whipped by the winds of the universe probably doesn't sound like a fun place to be. And at least we, I, I suppose we have some sort of ego base where we kind of feel like we're in control of shit to a certain degree. Yeah, so there's there's two things I would say to that. The first is that evolution has made our brains pattern detection yeah. obsessed. Mm -hmm. So there, there's 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 a survival advantage that has encoded into our brains a over eager pattern detection process mm -hmm. by which the idea of randomness is just something we're not adapted to. Mm. Because, you know, the, the easy way of understanding this is if there is a rustling in the grass and you think, oh, that's probably random, and it turns out to be a saber-toothed tiger, you die. <laughs> but if there's a rustling in the grass and it is a saber-toothed tiger and you run away, then it's better to have the false positive as a risk, right? So it's better to over-detect patterns than to under-detect them for survival. Mm -hmm. But that has created an evolutionary, evolutionary holdover where, like, now when, we, when there is genuine randomness, we inscribe you know, causation and, and meaning to it, which is part of the reason why conspiracy theories exist. Yeah. Because sometimes like random stuff happens and we would rather have a story, right? Yeah. Now, and, and sorry yeah, to cut yeah. you off there, but yeah, I want to make cool. a point. But also that's why people have a hard time believing reality. Like the, the horror of some events are so overwhelming. Yeah. You almost have to believe like 9-11. It was, I mean, it was horrifying. And there's lots of other examples of that. But people turn it into into conspiracy theories because they can't deal with the the horror or the or the randomness of it maybe yeah no it's 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 absolutely a coping mechanism and i think mm -hmm. you know this is why i don't 
I don't want to criticize it too much as a coping mechanism because I think it's very, it can be very comforting. I mean, you mm. know, if, if something terrible happened to me where I got a cancer diagnosis, for example, it's really difficult to just think, okay, my cells just randomly ended up producing cancer. That's, you know, it's, it's not comforting. It's comforting to think there's a reason this happened to me. So, you know, I think there's stuff like that where it is, it is potentially a useful mechanism to make sense of things, but it's not, I don't think it's strictly true. I think sometimes random things just happen even when they're bad. Yeah. But, you know, the, the other thing that I would say about this is I think that we are conditioned and probably have some innate tendencies to want to have like a, a cosmic purpose. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't think I do. I like, I, I think that if I am derived from like a shrew like creature getting infected a hundred million years ago and a mass murder in Wisconsin, 119 years ago and so on. And like the dinosaurs getting wiped out by a space rock that if it had been a second slower, I wouldn't exist. You know, like this chain of arbitrary things, I think I'm basically an, an accident of the universe. And that makes me feel like, you know, maybe the best thing to do is just to try to like make other people's lives better and enjoy the ride. And, you know, that, that's something that as I was writing the book, I really did change my worldview quite a lot because I think mm -hmm. I was very much, I, I, I sort of write about like the checklist existence and so on. And I, I was living this, right? Sort yeah. of here are like the 10 things I have to do today in order to like have a good day. And, you know, I, I think now it's just sort of like, I don't know, maybe if I walk my dog and have a nice day and yeah. you know, try to I don't help get someone. hit by a meteor today. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I don't know. That, that I, I think I just realized like that was enough for me. And I think yeah. that's something where this is where I find it really actually uplifting and helpful to accept the limits of control mm. because when you have the mentality that you have to control everything, it's for a purpose. It's for a, it's for fulfilling your ambition in life and so on. It's not, you mm. know, humans are striving beings. Like we should strive to do things better. There's no question about that. Mm. And like, you shouldn't just like, give up on life or whatever. But I think like the metrics we use sometimes are not about enjoyment or fulfillment. They're often about money and status and all these other things that like actually sometimes make us feel a little more empty so, yeah. you know, without going all, you know, Eastern guru on you, I, I just think that there is, I, I think there's an aspect of this where if you accept your cosmic accident swayed by a lot of things out of your control, it actually frees you up to focus on stuff that you actually enjoy more. I think it does too. I mean, being an atheist, being able to accept that, hey, I, I believe that there's something in this afterlife and I have the time and space between birth and death to do what I can and enjoy what I can and, and, and live what I can. And so that's what I'm going to do. And you know, there's some people in a religion that believe that if you think that way, then, well, you're just going to go murder and kill and, you know, pillage and, and everything else. But we do that on Fridays around here, but the rest of the time, you know, we follow the golden rule and, you know, we certainly can't have a medieval society that doesn't work out well if everybody just does what they want. So, you know, you, you, have, you play within the lines when it's not Friday. But this makes sense. One of the examples you used in your book was a couple going on vacation causing yes. 100,000 people to die. Tell us about that. Yeah. So so this is the opening story of, of Fluke. And it's, uh, it's basically the story of this couple that goes to Kyoto, Japan in 1926 on a vacation. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they do some sightseeing and they absolutely fall in love with the charm of the city. You know, it's one of these experiences you go on vacations. Oh, it's, this is now got a, I've got a soft spot for this city now forever. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason this matters is because 19 years later, the husband in the couple ends up as America's secretary of war. His name is Henry Stimson. Mm -hmm. And the target committee, which is in charge of deciding where to drop the atomic bomb, has picked Kyoto as its number one target. So Stimson is like, no, like, I don't want this to happen because I went on vacation there. So he meets with President Truman twice Holy shit. and he gets Kyoto taken off the list. So the first bomb goes to Hiroshima instead. And the second bomb is supposed to go to a place called Kokura. And when the bomber arrives at Kokura, boxcar, the second, the second bomber, mm -hmm. there's a briefly a cloud <laughs> that comes over Kokura and they can't see the target. So they get diverted to the secondary target, which is Nagasaki. Wow. So, you know, when you think about these things, like we always have these ideas that like these, there's a neat and tidy story that everything can fit into. But like, the reality was a 19 year old vacation on a cloud is why these two cities were incinerated rather than two other cities. And there's a, yeah. a saying even in modern Japan today called Kokura's luck. This is the city that avoided being destroyed by a cloud. And it refers to when you unknowingly escape disaster. So you're told, cause like for a very long time, Kokura did not know about this, right? It was only when they declassified the documents that they realized that they were one cloud away from the entire city being destroyed. That is, that's making my hair stand on end. But, you, and you think of the lives of all those people that have, that have that come since then, you know, kind of like your story of, of, of the murder of the family, well, uh, all the lives, all the children, all the, 
you know, the stuff that branches out from that. I'll, I'll go one one up on that because I have the I have this story actually in in Fluke is. I was telling you about contingency and convergence, right? This idea mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. There's a very famous scientist named Motu Kimura who was instrumental in, in, in coming up with some ideas that have reshaped evolutionary theory. And in 1945, he tried to avoid getting conscripted into the Japanese army. Mm -hmm. So he entered the University of Kyoto. And this guy who is like one of the main drivers of sort of the randomness and evolution mm -hmm. research would have been incinerated if these people had not gone on vacation 19 years earlier because he was right near where they were going to drop the bomb. Oh, and so, you know, there's there's all these things we couldn't possibly imagine it. The guy who was, um, I think his last name is Fujitsu. He was one of the guys who was one of the main weather researchers who had breakthroughs in understanding storms. Mm -hmm. And it's what the F in the F1, F2, F3, F4, F5 uh, tornado scale is named after. Mm -hmm. He was also in Kyoto. Wow. So, you know, it's like one of these things where you just sort of think that there's there's aspects of this where we just couldn't possibly imagine what would happen. And this is where when I was talking to a friend of mine, there was a historian I was talking to when I was writing the book. And he was like, yeah, OK, but like, if they dropped the bomb on Kyoto or Hiroshima or Kokura or Nagasaki, like the U.S. was still going to win the war. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, but do you not think that the world would be a little bit different if 200,000 different people had died? It's like, yeah, I think it would. So yeah, yeah that, that, that's the way where I think we impose, we impose categories on outcomes that I think are sort of irrational because there's a binary, either you win the war or don't, but the way you win the war affects history. And I think that's something we're often oblivious to. There you go. Jesus, I hit the snooze button this morning when I, when I woke up, I normally don't, but I just wanted more time. <laughs> and uh, wow, I, it makes me, it makes me wonder. It's almost like a gambling clock. Should I hit it three times and I'll survive today or maybe hit it <laughs> twice? I'll get hit by a bus. <laughs> Holy shit! It's, I think, but that doesn't. You know, I think it's bewildering. But the, the 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 sort of takeaway from it isn't that different from how you live your life anyway. Other than like feeling it's empowered, true. feeling like things are important, but like you can't control it, right? I mean, I can like sometimes. The one thing that I will say though that I didn't mention previously that I think is a cool idea that's related to chaos theory is like, and this helps for people who are feeling down, for example, right? everything good in my life has been directly caused by the worst moments in my life because they couldn't coexist without each other, right? There's a, oh, there's yeah. an unbroken chain of causes and events. Mm -hmm. And obviously that is true because a mass murder is what produced my joy. So like th th there's a, there's an unbroken chain of cause and effect up to that point. I find that really comforting. So like when I have a terrible time or something awful I'm dealing with, I'm like, yeah, okay. But like everything good in my life that is in the future is going to be derived from this moment. Well, now that's sort of, I think that's a nice idea anyway. There you go. I mean, that's a way to, to frame it and think about it because I mean, yeah, if you, if you think about, I was kind of joking around with, uh, maybe I should hit the Suze button again. So I survived today. You could go mad with that sort of thing and, yeah. uh, you know, live your life, enjoy your life, you know, uh, every day above ground is a good, is a good day. I remember I was complaining with, uh, I was complaining when I hit 50 on Facebook, I was like, Oh God, I hit, hit my birthday today. I hit 50 pose me. And I was being a little bit tongue in cheek about it as I am, but you know, somebody wrote me and they said, you know, Chris, you should probably serious yourself up a little bit. There's a lot of people, probably millions of people that wanted to be 50 that never made it to 50. So maybe you should just kind of have some gratitude. <laughs> and man, that hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, yeah, I should probably shut the hell up. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I see their point. I mean, I think it is something where I, the other thing that I think about this stuff with is our world is just like really weird, right? Mm -hmm. Like what we were talking about before, like the shrew gets infected and then mammals get, you know, like we just live in this really weird world. And I think it's sort of just sort of funny, like, you know, it's just sort of, we, it's just so bizarre. And all you can really do is just sort of make the most of what you get. And I yeah. think that's basically, you know, it's really very banal advice, but I think it's also just true. Like there's, there's there nothing you. else that you can do. So yeah. you might as well enjoy it. And we're all here today because mom had a headache, but dad gave her a back rub and <laughs> uh, yeah, somehow he worked that whole thing out. I mean, I, I saw a joke this year, I think it was on mother's day and like, really we should be celebrating fathers because if, if dad hadn't, hadn't pushed the envelope, we probably wouldn't be here anyway. But uh, you know, I, I came, I grew up in a cult and the cult's teaching was that God chose each of us to come to this planet at the times we were supposed to come to this planet, which totally defies, you know, what we've talked about with, you know, maybe dad just gave a good back rub that night. And, uh, you know, it defies science and everything else. I mean, it, when you think about how many, I mean, I don't know how many millions of sperm are going at the egg when, when that happens. And 
and stuff. I mean, just the odds or just the odds of whatever. I just wish there was a take back sometimes where you could be like, can we return this one? I'm just kidding. That's my fourth child. So anyway, any, any further thoughts that we might have missed or you want to tease out to people on the book as we go? <laughs> No, you know, I mean, I think I think there's a a lot of you know historic events where this is like really invisible, but actually is very important. And the the Kyoto story is just one of them. They're they're throughout the book. the The other thing that I think is is worth highlighting is that because the world is so uncertain and so complex and so weird and bewildering to navigate, one of the lessons in that is experimentation is a really smart idea, right? Mm-hmm. I think one of the things that happens is if you have this sense of control and you have the sense of certainty, then you should optimize the absolute limit. And efficiency is your like major driver, right? Because mm-hmm. like you, you already know exactly what you want and like you just might as well go get it. If you accept uncertainty and a lack of control and so on, then you should try new things more. You should experiment more. And this is the kind of stuff like evolution also has a lesson to teach us here because all of the amazing life forms and and problem solving ways that evolution has survived, produced surviving creatures throughout history has come from experimentation. You know, it's like try these things. Oh, it worked. Oh, we made an eye. That's amazing. Now the thing can see and it's going to survive more. So, you know, I, my, my attitude towards this is a lot of modern society and a lot of what we're told is just optimize everything. It's like the life hack existence. Everything has to be exactly this way, right? And I think if you dial that down a little bit and dial up the experimentation, I think it's actually a much smarter way to navigate the uncertainty of life and, and, and an ever-changing society. There you go. Kind of, you know, what was it, Emerson? 10,000 attempts to create the light bulb sort of thing and that sort of deal, you know? Yeah, well, and also, I mean, when when it comes to invention, I mean, a lot of the best Mm -hmm. inventions that have ever been produced were produced when the person stopped trying to invent. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the Wright brothers came up with their idea for the plane when they were having a picnic, and Mm -hmm. they saw some buzzards. And, you know, Galileo came up with the idea of a a clock pendulum when he was sitting in a cathedral and saw a swinging chandelier. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, 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 it's often this stuff where I think we try to force things and control things. Mm-hmm. And sometimes like letting go, like I, 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 there's a section, the acknowledgement section of fluke has a, a little ode to my dog. And it's not really that I'm like, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's also like true because a lot of my most creative ideas in writing came when I walked him, when I was like, okay, I can't write today. I don't have any good ideas. And I just step away from the computer, mm-hmm. go out for a walk. And then, you know, th- that's when the idea comes to me. So I think, I think relinquishing control is not the worst thing in the world, basically. Yeah. Because you really don't have it anyway, right? For the yeah, most I mean, part. it's just an acceptance of the way the world is, really. <laughs> I'd rather off in reality than in some sort of fantasy mode where, where you know, I, I have some sort of weird thing that actually probably limits my ability to operate in reality, I suppose. There well, I you think, go. you know, the, the thing that really struck me over the head, with, you know, I'm a political scientist by trade, and one of the places I do research is Madagascar, which is one of the mm-hmm. poorest countries in the world. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, you know, like 40% of the island has electricity. The average person's living on like less than $2 a day. Wow. When I go there, I sort of think to myself, like, what if I had been born here, right? I, I don't care how talented I could be. I don't care, you know, wh- how hardworking I could be. Like, I would still be in rural Madagascar, right? Like, just it's, yeah. it's a place that's... So the, the thing is, like, we always tell ourselves, oh, we deserve our success. I'm like, I did not choose when I was born. I did not choose where I was born. I did not choose who are my parents. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't, I didn't choose my brain. I didn't choose anything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah, okay, like, within those constraints, I've tried to make the most of my life. But, like, those are some pretty big constraints. <laughs> so, yeah. And I had nothing to do with them. So it's, mm-hmm. it's a sort of strange thing to think that way. You know, you see this in the hustle culture or and, and stuff like that, where you too could be a billionaire if you just maybe do these five things. And I think I've, I think I heard Elon Musk say it once, but I think, I think somebody said you, you maybe it was the Amazon guy, but you, the luck is so much a part of it yeah. and probably the chaos theory of it, you know, the right being at the right place, the right time in the moment. I can think of times in my life where, Sometimes the biggest seminal changes and redirections of my life that that enrich my life, and maybe maybe the darkest moments too, as you mentioned earlier, have been the biggest changes in my life that have either made it actually made it better. The dark times, you know, you you learn something from them and and you make something better of it. Yeah, you know, so I, I actually have a there's a, a brief section in fluke where I talk about this this relationship between luck and wealth. And there's an amazing mm-hmm. study that was done by these economists and physicists work, working together where they make this sort of fake world and they have you know a distribution of talent and so on, which is like a standard distribution. In other words, it's sort of like a bell curve. So the biggest group of talent is around the average, 
and there's some a really small group of extremely talented people and a really small group of extremely untalented people. And then into this model, they inject luck, right? Mm-hmm. Now, luck is like a lightning strike. It just hits wherever. Mm-hmm. And what they found was that every time they ran the simulation, the richest person in the model was almost always from right around the middle. And that's because there's the most people there. So the lightning is going to hit in the middle. It's not going to hit the extremes, right? Because there's so few people at the extremes. Mm -hmm. So every time they reran these simulations, it's always like the, the, the really, really talented people and the really untalented people. Yeah, there was a correlation a bit. But mm-hmm. like the richest person in the simulation was the one who was like moderately talented, but got lucky mm-hmm. twice. <laughs> and, oh. and, and, and I think this is, I think it's very firm logic that you're, you're going to have luck hit most often around someone who's of medium talent, just because, you know, out of 8 billion people, there's about six and a half billion people who are of medium talent, you know? So it's, there you go. that's, I, I think this is something where when we infer backwards, we always think, oh, they must've been a genius. And it's like, well, mm. you know, there are a lot of people who had really smart ideas that didn't get rich. And there's a lot of really stupid people who did get rich. So, you know, you can't over infer based on some accidental outcomes that you should follow the pathway of the rich person. There you go. You know, I remember reading one of my first big books I read on politics was Schlesinger's book. I believe it was Schlesinger's book, 1000 Days on Kennedy. And when you read how Kennedy handled the Cuban Missile Crisis, and then you saw how well Nixon handled things, you have to wonder, you know, I used to sit as a kid and I'd be like, Jesus Christ, what if Nixon had won the election? What if what if the Kennedys had the mob stuff all the ballot boxes? I'm just kidding, people. It's a theory. You know, when he won, I mean, would Nixon have, you know, brought us to the the brink of to the well to the end? You know, there were certain so there were certain aspects of John F. Kennedy's mind that kept that from from you know turning into oblivion and us exiting from the race. And if you read the details of it, we we came down to the wire. So, you know, yeah, yeah, the course of human history, the course of governments and, and everything else, it's, it's really interesting to think about. There's something else I had, but it's lost now. Anyway, give us your final pitch out to people who are the book and on the show and .coms where they should go to get it. Yeah, so the, the book Fluke is available anywhere you buy books. Support your local bookshop if you can. And mm-hmm. my, my newsletter is called The Garden of Forking Paths. I write about various topics related to Fluke on there all the time. So check that out. And if you're more politically minded, my Twitter is at Brian Kloss, but I mostly tweet about <coughs> politics. So if you don't like politics, don't follow me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I saw some of your prior books that should be interesting coming with the coming election. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. I'll be reading those. I just, do I have a savior democracy joke? But, oh, I remember the joke I had. The joke I had was that, you know, when you look at Elon Musk and how lucky he is at forming so many corporations and everything else, you know, it, it's, it stacks and people are like, why does it stack? But that lightning thing kind of explains it. It also probably explains why Nick Cannon somehow seems to keep breaking condoms with 15 kids. So I don't know what that's about. Anyway. Well, you, you, Elon, Elon Musk applied for a job at Netscape and got rejected. And the world might be a very different place if he'd gotten hired. So yeah, he got fired from PayPal too. Yeah, so, indeed, yeah. yeah, there you go. Anyway, thank you very much, Brian, for coming to the show. This has been really insightful. I had a great time and, and I loved your jokes as well. So thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, sir. Folks, order the book wherever fine books are sold. Fluke, Chance, Chaos, and Why Everything We Do Matters. January 23rd, 2024. Order it while you can. I picked up the audio book on pre-sale. So give it out to your friends and neighbors, especially the crazy ones, and maybe they'll understand the world a little bit better. Or or maybe they'll just think they'll come up with something more conspiracy. Like, uh, there you go. Anyway, thanks so much for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, Chris Foss, one of the TikTok and all those places. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you next time. And I should have us out. <laughs>